All right, today we're going to talk about transformations. Pause the video anytime you need to, to catch up with the drawing, or rewind if you need to. You have skeleton notes in your packets. Why don't you pause, find the skeleton notes, and then rejoin. All right, so I'm going to group these a little bit differently. It would be wise for you to realize you're going to be going back and forth and you might be moving around on the skeleton notes and filling in one section, then another section, and then coming back to a, the first section again. And that's the way we'll group things. So with transformations, we can break them into the vertical category and the horizontal category. We generally we'll find that the vertical transformations feel easier to students because they are more intuitive. The horizontal transformations oftentimes feel a little backward, okay? So one of the first transformations that we're gonna talk about is a slide or a translation. All right? So sliding a graph or moving the graph around or translating it, it's the same thing. Slide's a little bit more slang. Translation is a little more formal. So to slide a graph up, then you're going to add to the Y coordinate. So you would say Y plus A. However, we are going to use function notation and we're going to say F of X plus A. But what you're technically doing is just adding something to the y coordinate. All right. So this moves the graph up a units. All right. What's similar to that is translating or sliding a graph down a units. So in that case, you subtract a number from the y coordinate which would be the same thing as saying f of x minus some number. And we'll say this moves the graph down a units. So if you're having a hard time seeing, maybe that's a little more clear, okay? Now, we have the same sort of thing with horizontal transformations, but instead of adding or subtracting to a y coordinate, I'm going to add or subtract to the x coordinate, but it's going to feel like it's reversed. So I'm going to add or subtract to the x coordinate, but I'm going to say, well, I need to just put that in to function notation. So I'll have f of x plus a and f of x minus a. Now, you do know this translation already. You may feel like you don't. It's going to feel like it's backward. But this one is going to move the graph left A. This one's going to move the graph right A. So I'm just recording what I wrote. Moves the graph right A units. So you can use slightly different words on your charts. Use words that make sense to you so that when you review your notes, it registers with you what we were talking about. So let's look at a few horizontal and vertical slides or translations. So if you look at the part of your notes that has the parent function y equals x squared, we're going to look at a vertical translation and a horizontal translation. So on this one, guys, in function notation, this would be f of x, and then I'm adding one to the caboose. This one would be f of x minus three, so you can get used to that function notation. Now we're using y equals x squared as a parent function because you're so familiar with it, but on this one, I literally take every y coordinate and add one. So if I start with my coordinate plane, I'm gonna say, all right, this point is at negative one, one, and if I add one to the Y coordinate, I go to negative one, two. This point zero, zero, if you add one to the Y coordinate, you go to zero, one. 
this point is at one one and if i add one to the y coordinate i go to one comma two so you are used to the graph just being elevated or sliding it up to um, one unit okay so that is one of your rigid transformations rigid transformations are those that preserve the graph in its size and shape they just move it around or maybe flip it over so let's look at y equals x minus three squared now you all know that this moves the graph right three and remember i said f of x minus a moves the graph right a so here's an example of that that's right a specifically right three units on this one you all know that so what i'm going to do is i'm simply going to say this point on the original parent functions at negative one one move that that point right three units so it's going to move from negative one to one two three and then comma one this point is zero zero move that point right three units so it comes to three zero and this point is at one one it goes to four comma one when you add three to the x coordinate okay so you all are used to those kinds of transformations so again make a note that translations are rigid because the size and shape of the graph is preserved even when you move it around now another re uh, transformation which is rigid is a reflection that's the that's the correct name but we sometimes say that we're flipping the graph or spinning the graph a lot of times you'll hear me say that you flip the graph over the x-axis which is vertical or you spin the graph about the y-axis that would be horizontal all right well what's it take for you to do that well you would be either multiplying the y's by a negative which the function notation would be negative f of x. And that is going to um, reflect the graph over the x axis. Okay. You can also say you're flipping the graph upside down, or you could say you're flipping the graph from top to bottom. So either of those would be reasonable ways to say it. Now, the corresponding transformation in the left to right direction would be to say, let's do F of negative X. So instead of a negative in front of the whole thing, there's just a negative in front of the X. So this likewise is going to reflect the graph over the Y axis. And you'll hear me say that means you're going to spin the graph about the y-axis okay or you might say you're going to spin it from left to right okay so let's take a look at one of those so if we go back to our parent function that we're really familiar with y equals x squared then the example that says y equals negative x squared is an example of reflection so this would be negative f of x okay now if you said y equals negative x squared where the negative was only with the x that would be f of negative x i'll talk about this one in just a minute but here you are literally multiplying each y coordinate by a negative that's all that's going on so for instance i would say right here on the parent function that is one negative one one if you multiply the y coordinate by a negative it goes to negative one negative one this point zero zero if you multiply the y coordinate by a negative it goes to zero comma negative zero which is still zero zero this point is one one if you multiply the y coordinate by a negative, it goes to one, negative one. 
So guys, this is again a rigid transformation. If you simply spin or flip a graph, it doesn't change its size or shape. So that's a rigid transformation. So let's recap. Your rigid transformations are your translations and your reflections. So why didn't I put this one on the page? Well, number one, if you're talking about spinning a graph about the y-axis, do you see that if I were to spin this graph like 180 degrees from left to right, it's going to overlap itself. But look, I know that negative x squared is negative x times negative x, which is positive x squared. So you can also see algebraically that negative x quantity squared and x squared are al algebraically the same. So they're graphically the same thing too. So that's why I'm not making a deal out of that. That's not always the case. We'll get the sum that aren't that way. Now we're going to look at stretches or shrinks. Now stretches or shrinks are your first example of a non-rigid transformation. Because if you stretch or shrink a graph, you're obviously going to change the size of the graph. So if you change the graph's size or shape, it's non-rigid. Again, if all you do is move the graph around, or if you flip the graph in some way, you don't actually change the size or shape of the graph, so that's rigid. Once I start messing around with the shape or the basic appearance of the graph or its size, it's called non-rigid. So um, I want to stretch or shrink a graph by multiplying the y by a number. So a times y. Well, I'm not going to use y. I'm going to use a times f of x because I'm going to use my function notation. So if a is greater than 1, you're going to stretch. Now, I'm going to use words that make you think vertical. You're going to stretch the graph tall. So what you're going to do is you're going to stretch it away from the x-axis. So you stretch it top to bottom. If a is less than 1, you're going to shrink the graph short. And so I'm using the words tall and short because it makes you think tall, short, as opposed to wide, narrow, okay? So again, I'm gonna stretch the graph tall or shrink the graph short. If I shrink the graph short, I compress the graph in closer to the x-axis, okay? So I could say stretch the graph tall, pulling it away from the x-axis, or shrink the graph short by compressing it in toward the x-axis. So I'm gonna have the corresponding transformation with my x's. So instead of saying a times y, I'm gonna say a times x, which would be f of a x. So it looks like facts, doesn't it? So I'm not gonna get too into this because we're really gonna talk about this when we hit trig. So for the most part, I want you to just say, oh, if I multiply x by a number, then it's going to stretch the graph wide or shrink the graph narrow. Now, if you stretch the graph wide, then you open it like an accordion and you stretch it wide from left to right. So you're pulling it up away from the y-axis. And if you shrink the graph narrow, you're taking the whole graph and you're compressing it toward the y-axis. So that's going to change your domain for sure. So um, in, I, I don't want to say too much about this because we're going to spend so much time with it. But again, this is going to feel backward. Remember, x plus a kind of feels like it should move right, but it moves left. x minus a feels like it should move uh, left, but it moves right. So the x's a lot of times kind of feel like they're in reverse. So I don't want to say too much now about why this is. But if you want to stretch the graph wide, a needs to be less than 1. So when I say less than one, I mean positive, but I mean like a fraction, like maybe one half or one third or one fourth. If you actually want to compress the graph and make it real skinny, 
a has to be greater than one. So if you had like f of three x, it would be three times more narrow than it would normally appear, okay? But I'm not gonna have you graph any of those right now, okay? Now, if you're matching and you've got a, a horizontal stretch or shrink, then you just know to match all the others and that would be the leftover one. But let me say something while we're here. Whenever you uh, change the graph vertically, so if there's some change to the f of x, okay, where you're adding to or subtracting from f of x or you're multiplying f of x by a number, you are only changing y's, which mean you could, means that you could be changing the range of the graph and you're gonna change the appearance of the graph top to bottom, but you will not change the graph left to right. You will not change the domain. If you see the transformation has something to do with adding to or subtracting from the x or multiplying the x by a number, then you are only changing the graph from left to right, which could potentially change the domain, but will not change the range. And you might think, why is she being emphatic? If you can get this whole thing through your head that changing the y's only changes vertical and changing the x's only changes the horizontal, you'd be amazed at how much easier all this stuff becomes. So going back to our y equals x squared um, parent function, y equals 3x squared is a vertical transformation. It's a vertical stretch because in function notation, this would be three times f of x, which literally says triple your y coordinates. All right, now, if I had y equals 3x squared, where I was multiplying the interior x value by three, then it would be doing something left to right. So I don't wanna get into that right now, but this would be a horizontal. And because the three is bigger than one, it would actually be a horizontal compression. You would make it three times as skinny. I'm not gonna show you that right now but this would be f of 3x if you wrote it in function notation. Not gonna get into how to graph that. All right, so on this one, you literally say this point has a y coordinate of one. So multiply the y coordinate by three. So the point becomes negative one, three. This point has a y coordinate of zero. If you triple the y coordinate, you get zero comma three times zero, which is still zero, zero. This is one, one. If you triple your y coordinate, it becomes one, three. So the impact is that you're getting a tall, skinny parabola. Now, truly, it's a tall parabola. But when we take a graph that's already like an even function, when you make it tall, it also looks skinny, but technically it's really just a taller function. So you know how to graph this one because you are doing this in algebra one and algebra two. So this is just me putting together a lot of transformations in the one, but they're familiar. So I know that you know the x plus one is telling you to go left one. The minus three is telling you to go down three. This one half is telling you make it half as tall. That means you're shrinking the graph vertically. So we're going to talk about this a little bit because that's usually where people get the most mixed up. But let me go ahead. Oh, and let me say this. The function notation would be one half f of x plus one minus three, okay? f of x already squares the input, so you don't need to put squares or something on there. That's usually where people mess up. But I need to go left one down three. So let's see here. If I go left one down one, two, three, so that would be here. Now, 
normal, if the A value is one, normal, I wanna remind you means from the vertex go out one, up one. And remember the reason is that one squared equals one. With any quadratic, no matter where the vertex is, the A value always tells you how to count from the vertex the same way. Normal would be out two, up four, because two squared equals four. We're talking about a squaring function. So normal would be out three, up nine, out four, up 16, out five, up 25, right? But I'm gonna go half as tall. So if A is one half, I'm gonna go out one, and instead of going up one, I'm only gonna go up half that much. So up a half. Okay, well that's kind of hard to show, out one, up a half. I can do it, but it's not the best looking graph when I do that, because it would be imprecise for a reader to look at. I could also go out two, and instead of going up four, I would go up half of four. So that would be going up two. Oh, sorry about that. So I would go out, out two from here, and then up two. And I like that point because then it's precise. So out two, up two. Now I can connect all my points and I get this parabola that is shorter and therefore looks fatter than the original parent function. I know you knew how to do that one, but we're just talking about it in terms of transformations generally to all functions now. So find the parent function that looks like this on your skeleton notes. So it doesn't matter if you have an equation or not, we're gonna use transfer, uh, function notation to enact our transformations. So I see I'm supposed to do f of x minus two. Now remember, this means y's minus two. So if on every single point, you subtract two from the y coordinate, the effect is that the whole graph is going to move down two. So let's see here. So if I move my way left to right, then uh, the starting point, I'm just gonna move from left to right. So my starting point at negative four, one, I'm gonna subtract two from the Y coordinate. That moves me down to negative four, negative one. So this point's negative three, two, subtract two from the Y coordinate, I get negative three, zero. Now, most of us, once we get going, we'll just sort of start following suit and we won't do this to every single point. So these points both have a Y coordinate of one, again, hold the negative, uh, the X is negative two and the X equals negative one steady, but drop the Y coordinate by two units. So then I can see, all right, go right one down one from there. So that's easy to do. That's a straight line. Now remember, since I'm just moving the graph down, it's rigid, which means the shape is preserved. So these are all line segments, but now I get two shapes that look kind of like parabolas. So keep the rounded shape, don't change it. So this is one negative two. If I subtract two from my Y coordinate, it becomes one negative four. And then the next one will be back at two negative two. So I'm gonna try to preserve that parabola shape and ditto right here, it just dips one. So again, probably you can do a lot of these like super fast. So on negative f of x, remember this is negative y. So I'm only changing the graph top to bottom. Keep in mind, I know that means nothing changes left to right. So I can still set up my x-axis from negative four to four, just like the parent function. So only multiply your y-coordinates by negative. So negative four, one goes to negative four, negative one. Negative three, two goes to negative three, negative two, because I'm just multiplying y's by the negative. These two points both get a y-coordinate that's negative one again. And so you know already and can start to move faster that this guy's gonna turn the graph upside down. Zero, zero goes to zero, negative zero, so no change. 1, negative 2, if you multiply negative by the y coordinate, goes to 1, positive 2. And then 2, 0, no change in y. 
and then three negative one goes to three positive one and then four zero no change so that was pretty easy right so the range doesn't change but the graph definitely looks different from bottom to top one half f of x is half of your y's change the graph somehow from bottom to top do not change the graph from left to right so on my left to right i'm keeping it at x equals negative four to x equals positive four so again multiply your y coordinates by half so negative four one becomes negative four one half so i'm going to compress the graph toward the y-axis or the x-axis excuse me so negative three two multiply the y value by half it goes to negative three one both of these points have y coordinates of one those y coordinates go to one half no change in the x zero zero would be zero to uh, zero comma half a zero still zero this point uh, one negative two multiplying the y coordinate by half would be one negative one i still have two zero this point's three negative one multiply the y coordinate by half you get three comma negative one half and the last point remains unchanged as well so i took the graph and went toward the x-axis so now look on this graph i could say that my range is negative two to positive two but here my range is negative one to one so i changed the range but the domain is negative four to four on both of them vertical transformations cannot change the graph left to right so now i've got f of x plus two only the x's are being affected so my graph from bottom to top will not change but my graph will change from left to right so we know that this means go left to so that just simply means that this point negative four one goes left to to negative six one and then this point negative three two goes left to to negative five two and again most people once they get it going they don't keep overthinking it they just follow the pattern so i'm like okay scoop so down two and then back up and then scoop again so notice that the range from negative two to two is still the range from negative two to two so a horizontal transformation does not change y's but it did change the x's the domain is now negative four to positive two. So f of negative x is going to only change the x coordinates, and I'm just going to methodically go through. I will not change the y coordinates, I will not change the range. So if I start again left to right, I'm going to have negative four, one, multiply the x by negative, that goes to positive four, one. negative three two if i flip the y or x coordinate goes to positive three two negative two one goes to positive two one negative one one goes to positive one one so do you see that the effect is that where i was graphing left to right I'm doing the exact same thing, but I'm graphing right to left. So I'm doing the left to right mirror image. So I can tell that I'm going to go in. Now these scoops, I'm going to do this way. Okay. So for instance, this point at one negative two, change the X coordinate goes to negative one, negative two. Two zero goes to negative two zero. Three negative one goes to negative three, negative one. So there's, there's one, whereas y equals negative f of x squared overlapped itself when you flipped it left to right. This one, you definitely see a change in the graph. Another one now that's simple to do is the last one you see, the negative f of negative x. So what I could do is take the black graph and when I put a negative in front of it, do you recognize that just creates a vertical reflection? So I'm going to reflect the black graph vertically. So when I do that, I wind up getting 
this graph. So I'm just graphing on top of the one I just did because it makes it a little faster for you watching. So that's when I'm flipping it not only upside down, but I'm also spinning it left to right. So once you have one of the two, now I could have also taken the graph I did earlier. Um, I had negative F of X earlier, and I could have taken that graph to do this one and taken that graph and moved it, flipped it over left to right. So there are those. Now we've got to do my two favorite ones coming up. Now you've got two more transformations, which I didn't mention with just Y equals X squared. They are your absolute value transformations. And I think these are the most fun. So if you do the absolute value of F of X, remember this is like doing the absolute value of Y. So that is vertical. So go back and fill in the chart on your um, front page for the vertical transformations. So I literally go point to point to point and do the absolute value of all my Y coordinates. Let me move this and make some room here. So I will not change the graph left to right. But I will change the graph top to bottom. How do I know that? Because the absolute value of Y only affects Y values, not X values. Okay. So I literally go through and just do the absolute value of each Y coordinate. So here, negative four, one, the absolute value of one, still one. So no change. Here, negative three, two, the absolute value of the two is still two, no change. The absolute value of these one Y coordinates, still one. So no change to negative uh, two, one and negative one, one. Well, this isn't very fun. All right. So now on this middle point, zero, zero is zero comma the absolute value of zero, still zero, zero. Now it gets more exciting. So this point is one negative two. Take the absolute value of the Y coordinate and you get one positive two. The Y coordinate here is zero. The absolute value of zero is zero, no change. Here, your Y coordinate is negative one. Take its absolute value, you get positive one. So three negative one becomes three positive one, four zero, no change. Now, the absolute value graph graphs are also non-rigid. I have just changed the size and the appearance of the original graph. So I've not just moved it around or flipped it or something like that. It's totally changed the graph. So this is pretty cool. So on your notes, what might you say? Well, you wanna, you wanna make sure you get something in there about the part of the graph um, that's on or above the X axis stays the same. But what happens? So you take, don't just say, well, the negative becomes positive. That's telling me numerically what's happening. It's not telling me what happens to the graph. So you wanna say the part of the graph that's below the x-axis is reflected. So you might say it's flipped up or something like that. So it's reflected up over the x-axis. So only a piece of the graph changes, okay? So think about it. Um, if I had something, I'm gonna erase this so I can show you a few things. If I said, okay, uh, if we play Simon Says, and hopefully we'll get a chance to do this in class because it's fun. But if I said, um, here's your original function, I'm just gonna make something up, all right? And I, okay, well, let's, let, yeah, let's do this. Here's your original function. I'm gonna say um, something like that, okay? So if that's f of x, if I said, let's do negative f of x, Okay, well, if you do that, do you rec recognize that that's simply gonna reflect and then reflect? 
All right, so I've kind of got half line, half parabola kind of going on. Um, what if I said your original graph looked like this? Part line, part parabola, and I called that g of x. Well, what's negative g of x look like? Well, negative g of x reflects both parts. So you would say, well, this part flips up and this part flips down. Cool? Well, what if I said, um, let's do the absolute value of g of x. Well, if you do that, this part flips up, this part, no change. So now the absolute value of g of x looks like my, my original f of x. So what if I said, let's do negative absolute value of g of x. Well, now you would take the absolute value graph and make it negative. So that would wind up being that graph, okay? So just, just some fun little things that you can do. I wanna show you something else that maybe you've not thought about before, okay? So if I said, let's look at y equals the absolute value of x. Now I know you know that that's a basic V-shaped graph with the vertex at the origin, but have you thought about it like this? Well, you could say the parent functions y equals x. Y equals x is the line that cuts through the origin and goes through 0, 0, 1, 1, et cetera. So it's the line that passes through the first and third quadrants at a 45 degree angle, all right? So now if I said, well, transform this function. So if I do the absolute value transformation, the right side, which is above the x-axis, stays the same, but the left side, which is below the x-axis, is reflected. And that's actually what's giving you the V-shaped graph. Now, here's another one, and you're gonna do some of this in calculus, and people at first go, I don't know how to graph that. And I'm gonna go, oh yeah, you do. Think about the graph of y equals the absolute value of x squared minus four. And you might go, I don't know what that looks like. Yeah, you do, okay? Y equals x squared minus four. Think about that graph. Do we know that graph? Yeah, we do. That graph, of course, is a parabola that opens up with its vertex moving down four. I also know that if I factored it into x plus two, x minus two, that I would have roots at negative two, zero and positive two, zero. So that is that little parabola. So now apply the absolute value transformation to this graph. So the left leg stays the same and the right leg stays the same because they're already on or above the x-axis. But everything down here is reflected. So I wind up coming up to zero four and reflecting and I get an interesting little W shape, kind of W shape. Guys, the only reason the absolute value graphs that you know are V shaped is because you've only done absolute value of lines. Now we can add in absolute value of lots of graphs. Now we're gonna get into my absolute most favorite transformation because it's so not intuitive. So remember a minute ago when I said, let's pretend like this is the graph of G of X. And I said, let's do um, G of the absolute value of X. A lot of people would th think, well, if you just take the negative part and flip it up, if it's the absolute value of F of X, they think you just take the left part and flip it over. The problem is that if you say this part stays the same, this part's reflected, the problem is that this blue function that you get, which is the intu intuition most people have, fails the vertical line test. So that can't be it because that's not a function. So the intuition on this, not so great. So instead of trying to go with our intuition, let's build a T-chart so you can see how this proceeds. 
So my X's on my parent function go from negative four to positive four. So I put negative four to positive four on my T chart. So I'm gonna work my way across the graph. So when I plug in negative four, I have to do the F of the absolute value of negative four. The absolute value of negative four is four. F of four, I can see from my parent function, F of four is zero. So I'm gonna do the same thing. F of the absolute value of negative three is F of three because the absolute value of negative three is three. And from my parent function, I can see that F of three is negative one. Let me talk through it, but not write so much. So I've got to do the absolute value of negative two first. That's two. F of two from my parent function is zero. I've got to do the absolute value of negative one first. That's one. F of one from my parent function is negative two. There's a lag between what I'm saying and the video it looks like. So I've got to do F of the absolute value of zero. The absolute value of zero is zero. And from my parent function, F of zero is zero. Now on these, the absolute value of one, two, three, and four is still just one, two, three, and four. There went my lights again, sorry about that. Kind of makes the screen flash, doesn't it? Well, again, F of one is negative two. F of two is zero, F of three is negative one, and F of four is zero. Now, what I've got to do is graph this thing. This is gonna be a little bit smaller so I can fit it in. So it's the exact same size as my red graph. It's just uh, gonna be smaller because I'm gonna put the tick marks closer together. So let me say that's one, two, and negative one, negative two, and one, two, three, four. Again, the only reason I'm making it smaller is so it'll fit in in the space I've got and not run off the camera. All right, so I've got to plot negative four comma zero. I've got to plot negative three comma negative one. Negative two, zero. Negative one, negative two. And then I'm gonna plot zero, zero. I'm gonna plot one, negative two. Two, zero. Three, negative one. And four, zero. Well guys, I already know this part of the graph doesn't seem to be changing. It looks like the exact same points in my parent function, but now look like what I have over here. When I plot those points, my left side becomes a mirror image of my right side. So on your horizontal transformations, all right, and again, totally non-rigid, this is nowhere near the original graph. So I've totally changed the appearance of the original graph. It's a non-rigid transformation. So what are you gonna say on the transformation? I personally would say I, I maintained the right hand half the graph. So what did I do? I totally um, get rid of the left hand half the graph as it was in the original parent function and I replace it. So I replace the left half of the graph. So this is in your chart for the horizontal transformations. And what did I replace it with? A mirror image of the right half. So there is a little bit of memorization you're gonna to wanna to do there so you don't have to reinvent this wheel and do T-charts every time. We wanna recognize the transformation and implement it and then move on. So this is a problem I typically do on day two with my students. And I say, all right, here's G of X. Let's see if you can start putting together double transformations. 
And this tends to get the students kind of discombobulated. So let's do this together. All right, I see two transformations. I see a negative up front, which means a negative Y, that's vertical, but I see the absolute value of X, that's horizontal. Now you can really do either one first, but let me suggest that you at least mentally break this down. So think about what's the absolute value of X do? Well, that's the one we just did. It replaces the current left half with a mirror image of the right half. So if I did a little baby sketch on that, I would say, well, the right half looks like this. So if I replace the left-hand half with the mirror image of that, I'm still gonna have that semicircle looking shape, but then it's gonna look more like that. Okay, now that guy turns it upside down. So, if I did that, and again, I'm doing these quickly, but I just want to give you a general, that means it would look like this. So I'm doing kind of a quick thing, but the blue would be the final outcome. Let's do a couple more. So what if I said, let's look at the absolute value of G of X minus three. So again, one vertical, one horizontal. The vertical is the absolute value of Y. The horizontal is the X minus three. So it doesn't really matter which one you do first. How about I say, let's move, move it to the right first. Well, again, just a real quick thing. I'm, I'm not wanting to go overboard with this. Just show you kind of quickly. Well, if I move it right three, then this leftmost point, which is at negative three comma zero, is going to move to the right to zero, zero. So that means I'm gonna have this kind of upside down triangle. Then I'm gonna have the semicircle. Then I'm gonna have this rooftop looking thing. And what's gonna happen is that my domain's gonna move instead of from negative three to three, this is gonna move from zero to six. But now I need to say, wait a minute. So I took care of the right three thing. What do I do with the absolute value part? Well, that's the absolute value of Y because it's around everything. Oh, so the negative part flips up. So the only thing that's gonna happen is this part is gonna flip upward, but this is already above the X axis. This is already above the x-axis. This should be the same y's because it's going from negative two to positive two. So that's my final graph. So that shows that it moves it right and flips the negative part up. So let's do one more just quick. If I were actually asking you to do this, I would ask you to plot the points real nicely. But again, I'm just kind of wanting to give you a brief overview. So what if I said, let's do G of negative X plus two, all right? This one, again, has one horizontal, because that's negative X, and then plus two is like Y plus two. So I would suggest you do the flip first. So the general idea is this moves or flips the graph from left to right. So I would say, well, that means that this part now, if I flip this part over, the semicircle part, that's not gonna change. But this guy that goes currently to the right is gonna come up and go to the left. And this guy that's currently on the left is going to be on the right. So that's the left to right part. But then I've gotta do the plus two. So at that point, I would say, oh, okay. Well, this is at negative two. If I move it up to plus two, what's gonna happen is my triangle's going to move up to, so it's gonna sit on the x-axis. The semicircle is going to move where instead of it, it topping out at zero one, it's gonna to top out at zero three. So it's gonna come up here. So my semicircle part's gonna be like that. And then this guy currently tops out at two, it's gonna go up to four. So again, that's very, very quick, but that's the general idea. 
Now, some of your homework will give you an equation or a graph, and some of the questions they ask are, name the parent function. Well, do you recognize that the parent function would be y equals the cube root of x? And you need to know what this one looks like so you can talk about it. So if we, if we have a rule that we're going to put three points on every function at least, the cube root of x has zero, zero, the cube root of one is one, and the cube root of negative one is negative one, and the cube root function looks like this. So that's what my parent function looks like. So now it might say we'll outline the transformations. Well, the negative up front, I know, is going to flip the graph upside down, or you might say it reflects the graph over the x-axis. The negative x on the inside is going to spin the graph left to right. So I could say that you're going to spin the graph left to right, or I might say spin the graph about the y-axis. And then the plus two on the end moves the graph up to. So that would be an outline of the transformations if you're describing them verbally. And then it might say, okay, we'll do all that stuff. So think about it. Flipping the graph upside down is gonna make the general appearance like this. Now, spinning the graph left to right takes this, and if I take the, this graph and spin it left to right, it's gonna look like that. Now, wait a minute, spinning the graph upside down and then again left to right makes it go back to looking what, like what it did look like. Now move the graph up to units. So what I would have is zero, zero is going to move up to zero, two. One, one moves up to one, three. And negative one, negative one moves up to negative one, one. And so you wind up getting that as the outcome. So you'll have several that ask you to walk through each of those things. Now, the other thing it might do is ask you to give the function notation. So the function notation would be that I multiplied the y's by a negative, I multiplied the x's by a negative, and I move the whole thing up to. So that would be the function notation. So in the end, I might also say, well, write the equation of this graph. So you would need to know that the parent function is y equals square root of x. You also need to be clear that the square root of zero is zero, the square root of one is one, and the square root of four is two, okay? So, Normally, on the parent function, once you get your starting point, you go right one, up one, and from the starting point, you go right four, up two. So you need to know what the normal uh, counting patterns are. So on this one, I can see that the graph has been flipped left to right, and it's also been flipped upside down. So I expect there's a negative in front of the square root to account for the upside down. I also expect there's a negative in front of the X to account for the left to right. But I also need to recognize from a starting point, I'm not going right, but I'm going left one down two. Now the left one accounts for the negative X. The down accounts for the negative in front, but it's down two. I'm also going left one, two, three, four, down four. So I, I normally go right one, up one, and instead I'm going up or down two to go left or right four, up two, but I'm going left four, down four. So do you see that I'm doubling my normal vertical shifts. Instead of going one and two vertically, I'm going two and four. 
So if I'm doubling my normal vertical shifts, that means I need a two in front of all of that. So the um, function notation would be negative two F of negative X. Let's look at that last one. So on my last one, I noticed that my starting point moved from zero, zero, right to an up three. So that means that I must have something where if I want to move it right and up, I know that's my basic idea. Now I don't have any negatives because it's the exact same shape. Um, it's still going up and to the right as my original. So the only other thing I would ask myself is, do I need a number right here to show that I've stretched or shrunk it? But look, from my starting point, I'm going right one, up one, which is normal. And I'm going right one, two, three, four from my starting point, up two. That's normal. So I don't have a number right here. So in function notation, I would say, well, I moved it right to, and I moved it up three. And that's all there is. So you are ready to do the transformation homework.